of English as a lingua franca in ASEAN language education policy in Asia and Chinese rhetoric. Recent publications include English is English an Asian language? The Rutledge Handbook of World English, the Rutledge Handbook of Language Education Policy in Asia, co author with Anthony Litcraft, and the Willie Bagwell Handbook of Asian Varieties of English, and co editor with Kingsley. Walton and Werner brother. So we are very, very pleased to have you, Dr. Professor Kirkpatrick, Patrick among us. It is very early in the morning, I know. It's about eight o'clock at your place. So sorry to have disturbed you from your slumber. So <laughs> anyway, welcome once again and please before he starts giving a round of applause, welcoming him. Thank you, thank you very much. Can I just check, you can hear? You can hear me? Yeah, we can hear all right. Thank you very and much. Can you, can, you, and can you see the screen, my slides? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, I, it's actually nine o'clock because I'm in Switzerland, so it's not too bad. So, but thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, Today I want to talk about the, the, the notion of English being a language of Asia and what the implications of that are for the teaching of English in Asia. I think there are two points that I really want to stress. The first is that English is an Asian language and I shall give up reasons for my, uh, my argument in the talk. And it should therefore be taught as an Asian language rather than as a foreign language. The second thing is, if English is an Asian language and is taught as an Asian language, how can we also ensure that local languages, the national language, the relevant national language, can also be taught because these must not be neglected? And I'm going to try and argue that it is actually possible to teach both the national language and the children's mother tongue in some cases with English and so that people, children become multilingual with English as one of their languages. Okay, here's an outline then of the talk. The increasing place of English throughout Asia. I shall talk about this and then ask why this increase? What is causing the increase of the learning of English throughout Asia? Then I shall raise the problems and challenges that this brings with it. Primarily with the problems of local languages, are these being taught in schools or are they being removed as languages of education? Does the increase in English through Asia increase the division between the haves and the have-nots? Does it actually increase social division rather than decrease it. And then I shall give some suggestions for possible solutions and then conclude. In a recent survey of language education policy across Asia, and this is the book that I edited with Tony Lidicott, where we had something like 35 chapters each dealing with a particular Asian context and its language education policy. So this is based on 35 countries across Asia. The following five major trends were identified. One, the promotion of the respective national language as a symbol of national identity and unity. And in Bangladesh, that of course would be Bangla. Second, the promotion of English as the second language of education. Pretty well everyone has English as the second language of education. 
three, as a result of two, there is actually an increasing division between the haves and the have-nots, as government schools often face shortages of qualified teachers and lack access to suitable materials. And parents who can afford it are sending their children for private education in more and increasingly more numbers. Four, there is limited support for indigenous languages in education. And often these languages are present in policy documents, but not in reality. And as I'll argue later, when they are taught, they are often the responsibility of non-government organizations, NGOs, rather than the national government itself. And five, as a result of two and four, Many children are having to learn in languages that they do not understand. In the overwhelming majority of cases, English is promoted as the second language of education. It is also promoted as a medium of instruction for science subjects, such as maths. And it is being introduced earlier and earlier into the school curriculum. Now typically taught as a subject from grade three in government schools. But as I'll argue later, if parents have money, they will send their children to English medium schools earlier than grade three, including kindergarten, where English is the medium of instruction in kindergarten. So how widespread is the use of English in Asia today? Recent estimates suggest that there are some 800 million users of English in Asia. Now, very interestingly, this includes 276 million Chinese users. That's more than those, uh, the estimate for English users in India, which is 260 million. Why is that significant? Because India, of course, is the case par excellence of a post-colonial society in which English was introduced um, centuries ago and where English has had a semi-official status as an associate language, associate official language. China, on the other hand, was never colonized. Yet, despite that, 276 million Chinese are now using English, 12.5 million in Japan. These figures come from work by Kingsley Bolton and John Bacon Schoen based on government surveys and various other kind of uh, census data. And I think they're probably pretty reliable. And it is worth reiterating that this figure of 800 million users of English in Asia far outnumbers the total number of native speakers of English worldwide, which is probably about 350 million. But even that is interesting. The, the notion of a native speaker of English, you may say that the United States has a population of over 300 million, but not all of them by any means are native speakers of English. There is a huge migrant community in the States for whom English is a learned or second language. Why then are so many people across Asia learning and or using English? What's driving this? There are many reasons. One is the desire for English is driven by a neoliberal agenda and by the need to participate in globalization and international markets. If you want to become part of the international community, the argument goes, you have to have English in order to communicate with that community. So English is seen as a crucially important language or skill even for joining in internationalization, globalization, modernization. There is also the desire for people to be able to communicate their wishes and values to others. And English as the international lingua franca is an obvious language to learn to achieve this. If you want to let the world know about what is important to you, the best language in which to do it at the moment is English. 
The teaching of English for Islamic purposes in Indonesian madrasas and pasantren, these are the boarding schools attached to mosques, represent an excellent example of this. Indonesian academics were surveyed about their attitudes towards English, and these academics included uh, academics who were Muslim, who were Christian, and who were Hindu across a variety of universities in Yogyakarta in Indonesia. And the general feeling was, and these were remarks from the Muslim academics, I learn English because I want to be heard. English can deliver information about my religion. And this is a case by excellence, I think, of deculturation, deculturation from Anglo cultural values and acculturation, acculturation towards Islamic values, where English is being used to educate people about Islam. There are madrasas in Bangladesh, both state-run and private, and they also teach English, providing further evidence that English is both in and of Asia, although the standards reached are not very high in those cases, I'm told. This is work by Asadullah Chowdhury and John. Now, there are also regional motivations for learning English. We've thought of international ones. Here are regional ones. The 21 countries of the Asian Pacific Economic Community Group of Countries, APEC, have actively promoted the learning of English for some time. At the APEC ministerial meeting some 20 years ago, the member economies were encouraged to undertake measures to provide adequate knowledge and practical use of English as a working language within the APEC region. Now, a major regional motivation for the learning of English in Southeast Asia is the fact that the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, has made English the sole official working language of the group. This is unusual, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Uh, if one looks at the European Union, the number of official working languages of the European Union equal the number of languages spoken in the European Union, basically. Yet here in Southeast Asia, the sole official working language of ASEAN is English. Article 34 of the 2009 ASEAN Charter simply reads, the sole working language shall be English. In working on this in my research, I asked the then director of uh, CBO in Bangkok, whether Malay had ever been considered as a possible also working language for ASEAN, given the fact that Malay is spoken, or varieties of Malay are spoken in Malaysia itself, of course, Singapore, Indonesia, to a certain extent in the Philippines, in the south of the Philippines, and in parts of southern Thailand. But it, he dismissed this as saying, no, that would be opening Pandora's box. English and English only. The then Secretary General of ASEAN, the Vietnamese Li Long Min, speaking in 2013, nearly 10 years ago now, said, with the diversity in ASEAN reflected in our diverse histories, races, cultures, and belief systems, English is an important and indispensable tool to bring our community closer together. So he's arguing here that English is a useful and important or even indispensable tool to bring the communities of ASEAN together in its diversity. He goes on, used as the working language of ASEAN, English enables us to interact with other ASEAN colleagues in our formal meetings, as well as day-to-day -day communications. In order to prepare our students and professionals in response to all these ASEAN integration efforts, among other measures, it is imperative that we provide them with opportunities to improve their mastery of the English language, the language of our competitive global market, the lingua franca of ASEAN. So here's another kind of neoliberal agenda within the Southeast Asian community that they need English 
because it is the language of our competitive global market in which we must participate. There are also local motivations and demands for learning of English. Colonial legacy is a major cause for the use of English in what were outer circle countries in capturist terms. And this legacy can be realized in different ways. Outer circle countries are those countries that were previously colonized, normally by the British Empire, but in some cases by the Americans, in particular the Philippines. And in these countries, English has been left as a legacy in many different ways. Just one example here is the example of Hong Kong, which was a colony of the United Kingdom, where, it, for example, where in Hong Kong, six of the eight government funded universities in Hong Kong are English medium, a definite consequence of colonialism. And it was parental pressure that forced the Hong Kong government to fine tune its medium of instruction policy and allow more classes in Chinese medium secondary schools to be taught in English. This is the washback effect, of course. If the universities use English as a medium of instruction, parents of children will want to make sure that their children learn English to an adequate degree so that they can get access and enter the universities where English is an EMI. So the washback effect in classrooms is, is very strong. And here is an example where the amount of Chinese being taught in Chinese medium, there's Chinese medium secondary schools in Hong Kong is being reduced and the amount of English being taught is increasing. And this, so English is being used to teach the so-called science subjects in Chinese is the number of Chinese schools using this is reducing, which is, I think, a concern for people. And as Wang Gong Wu, the then vice chancellor of Hong Kong University, pointed out, to actually forsake the public school system that teaches in your own language for the private one that teaches in English is an increasingly common phenomenon. And I think you can probably see that in Bangladesh. It's certainly true in many parts of Asia where parents who can afford it are choosing English medium education for their children in increasing numbers. So when is English actually introduced in ASEAN state primary schools? Grade one, Brunei, Myanmar, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand. Grade three, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. In Singapore, English is the medium of instruction from grade one. Of the countries of ASEAN, English is the, sorry, Indonesia is the only ASEAN nation that does not make English a compulsory subject in primary school. The Philippines is alone in providing mother tongue based multilingual education, MTB MLE in 19 local languages from primary one to three. That sounds great, but there are some 170 languages spoken in the Philippines and only 19 are taught as mother tongues from primary one to three. Supporters of mother tongue based multilingual education have long argued for it to be adopted for grades one to six, not just grades one to three, but so far that has not been taken up. Until the introduction of MTB MLE, the Philippines had a bilingual language program. From grade one, English was used for science type subjects, while Filipino was used for arts type subjects. But Filipino is something of a created language, being heavily based on Tagalog, the language of the capital Manila. Children from elsewhere who spoke a different language, Cebuano, for example, and it's worth stressing that Cebuano is spoken by several million speakers, and who are not middle class, 
in the Philippines, that's the great majority, would find themselves at primary school having to learn in two languages, Filipino and English, that they did not understand. There are cases that the children might speak Cebuano as the regional lingua franca within the Philippines as a second language and have a first language, for a home language like Bohol or something. So they would have two languages that, with which they went to school. But when they got to school, they found that the medium of instruction was Filipino in English. And the result of this was, of course, dropouts. And we, we will find dropouts across Asia in primary schools for these reasons. So this explains the popular demand in the Philippines for MTB MLE. As the Filipino linguist and educator Gonzalez despaired, and he himself was Minister of Education in the Philippines for a short period, the formula for success in Philippine education is to be a Tagalog living in Metro Manila, which is highly urbanized and studying in a private school considered excellent. And of course, the formula for failure is the opposite, being non-Tagalog, studying outside of Metro Manila in a rural setting, in a public or government school considered substandard. And MTB Emily has met with criticism. The problem was that teacher training in MTB Emily methods was inadequate and teaching learning materials were provided in only 19 of the more than 170 Philippines languages. This was a case study of the MTBLE conducted by UNESCO in 2016. This is of course a huge issue. If you say we are going to use the child's home language as the medium of instruction in primary school, that means there has to be materials, teacher training, and so forth, so that teachers are able to teach content subjects through the home language. It also requires the parents to be supportive of this. And many parents will, will argue that they want English for their children because they think that English will allow their children to be successful in the education system eventually and get on to university and so forth. So it is a really big issue about how can we ensure that children learn not just English, but also their local language in the primary school and later. And I'll talk about ways of doing that in a minute. Some districts in the Philippines have therefore introduced further languages. For example, in South Central Mindanao, a scheme to teach in Languindanao, Hiligeno, and Tobole languages has been funded by Save the Children. Where and when it is successfully delivered, MTB MLE has shown excellent results. But I like to stress that even here, where it has, been, where it has shown excellent results, it has taken about five years for the teaching of MTB and may lead to be successful. And by successful, I mean that children who learn in the local language outperform children who learn in Filipino, both in Filipino and English, after three or four years of being taught in the home language. So the home language does not necessarily mean that you will not learn the local and the national language. In fact, if the home language is taught successfully, then it works as a bridge to the national language in English. But it's a very hard, it's hard work, and it takes us, I say, about five years to get the, the, the teaching materials, the teachers trained, the community involvement. Now to Malaysia, which is a fascinating case study. It's an interesting case study for the debate of which language to use and when. The journey of the English language in Malaysia has come full circle, from being relegated from the upper end to the lower end of the scale of importance, 
<laughs> it is now gradually moving back to occupy an important position. This journey included the battle between Dr. Makatir and Malay nationalists over the use of English in tertiary education. It's worth making a point here that Dr. Makatir's political career has been quite extraordinary. He was recently back as prime minister in the age of in, in the late 90s. In, in the age, he's in his late 90s, but he's now since reti retired, but an extraordinary political career. Those who support the use of English would probably agree with Farish Noor, who argued, yet the world will not wait for any nation, and nor does the world owe any nation a living. The champions of vernacular education in Asia and Africa may find momentary comfort and solace in the familiar territory of a vernacular culture that they recognize as their own, but refusal to face up to the realities of the global age we live in means we are in danger in condemning the future generation of our societies to a marginal position. And I think this is quite a commonly felt uh, view, commonly shared view among a number of people across the world. And this looks very much like the position adopted by the Anglicists in their debate with the Orientalists in the context of colonial India. And by that, I mean that the Anglicists during the early stages of the British colonization of India argued that the Indians should be taught or a very select group of Indians should be taught in English. And because English was much more important than local languages, where the Orientalists argued that the local languages should be the languages of education. <clears throat> the Anglic Anglicists appear to have been winning this debate in recent years, <clears throat> as more and more countries are introducing English earlier and earlier into the primary curriculum. For example, in 2014, Cambodia ruled that English should be introduced as a subject from grade four. However, it was clear that the basic requirements for this policy to be successful, suitable teaching materials and enough teachers with adequate English proficiency to teach them were not met. As an evaluation report noted, there is a lack of mechanisms to systematically prepare and support teachers who have low or no capacity to carry out the challenging task of teaching English to students. The report goes on with no English competence and absence of English training, the teachers can neither use nor guide students to utilize the English books. In my own experience of teaching in places like Burma and others, other places, I have found that there are almost ridiculous demands of teachers to teach in English when they themselves are unable to speak English to any degree of competence at all. And it's, it's such a waste of talent, a waste of children's uh, time and general feeling of self-importance and self-assurance if they're being taught languages that the teacher can't speak and the children have no chance of learning. Cambodia has, however, also implemented the Multilingual Educational National Action Plan, NINAP. But children whose mother tongue is not Khmer, the national language, only get to learn in their mother tongue up to grade three. And Cambodia is a country where it should be more easy, perhaps, for the national language and English to be taught side by side, as unlike many other Asian countries, Cambodia has a great majority of people who have Khmer as their first language. It's not quite as multilingual as many of the other language, uh, countries of Asia. But it is not surprising that many children drop out of school at around grade five.
In their report, Education for All by 2015, UNESCO urged a number of Southeast Asian countries, including Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Laos, and the Philippines, to develop forms of multilingual education to help counter this alarming dropout rate. To date, only the Philippines has really tried to do this in a systematic way that is being sponsored by the government itself. Now to China. As I mentioned earlier, China has the largest number of English users per country in Asia. But the People's Republic of China's language policy is explicit. The variety of Chinese Putonghua is the language of education alongside its written form, modern standard Chinese. Interestingly, and perhaps extraordinarily, other Chinese languages such as Cantonese or Shanghainese are not to be used as languages of education. English is the main second language of education and is introduced across the country at grade three. Yet, as I mentioned before, wealthy parents in cities like Beijing, Nanjing or Shanghai are sending their children to elementary schools and kindergarten that teach English as a medium of instruction. In the National University Entrance Exams in China, <coughs> English is a core subject and shares equal weight with Chinese and maths. There's been some debate about this recently with some people saying that English should not have the same weighting as Chinese and maths in the final exam. But as far as I'm aware, it still carries the same weight. English is also seen in China as a vital tool for international communication. The need for English is reflected in the desire of Chinese to communicate across borders. English connects Chinese people to the world, either directly through travel or education or abroad, or even symbolically by connecting young people to life outside mainland China at a range of levels, from popular culture to current affairs or to various forms of academic knowledge. While Indonesia remains the only Asian country which does not prescribe the teaching of English of, sec of the, uh, primary school, English is still the second language of education. The great majority of Indonesia's 700 or more languages are not taught in school in a systematic way. There are cases where Javanese, which is spoken by some 70 million people in Indonesia, is taught in schools, but in a way that there is a sort of Javanese day where children are encouraged to speak their home language. But of the 700 languages, very few are taught in school in a systematic way. And as the Indonesian scholar Hadi Santosa remarked, with the emerging and mushrooming demand for English, schools then drop the local language in order to give more time to the English teaching. As a result, in the long run, children and the younger generation can no longer speak the local language. This is culturally and linguistically pitiful. I'm sure you have come across it. I have in my time where the, the students I teach at university, whether they come from Indonesia or China or wherever in Asia, are often saying that they can't speak to their grandparents because they no longer speak the language of their grandparents' generation. And the gen grandparents, of course, can't speak English very well. And there is a problem between generations communicating within the same family tree. What about Bangladesh? Well, you know much more about Bangladesh than I do, but I ask these questions in the context of Bangladesh. Is there tension between the public and private sector, especially in regard to the use of English medium? Nationalism, pro-Bangla versus the market, pro-English. How are the languages other than Bangla catered for? Are NGOs or the government mainly responsible for the teaching of languages other than Bangla. 
BRAC, the building resources across communities, is heavily involved. And BRAC is the largest NGO in the world, and its education program is the largest secular and private education system in the world. In addition to operating thousands of primary and secondary schools in Bangladesh, it also runs something over 1,500 ethnic minority schools in the southeastern region. So it seems that the main driver of the teaching of languages other than Bangla is in the hands of NGOs. So <clears throat> there is no doubt that English is being taught and used more and more across Asia. It has become, I will argue, an Asian language. But is it possible to combine the teaching of English with the teaching of local languages? I shall now argue that it is. Excuse me while I just take a sip of. Two, two major developments need to be taken into consideration. The first development is that English has become an Asian language. It is not only in Asia, but of Asia. Now, Brad Catru listed four criteria and functions of a language and English in Asia fulfills all four of them. The four functions were, it is a vehicle of linguistic communication across distinct linguistic and cultural groups. So people from different linguistic backgrounds often use English to communicate with each other. It is a nativized medium for articulating local identities within and across Asia. This is certainly true as we have varieties of English that have developed from Singaporean, Filipino, Bangladeshi, Indian, and so forth. It is one of the pan-Asian languages of creativity. There is a tremendous amount of literature, for example, that is written in English uh, by Indian Asia, and Asian authors generally who are writing in English. They're writing literature in English. They're not writing English literature, they're writing Asian literatures in English. Here we are. Sorry, I missed a slide. Fourth, it is a language that has developed its own sub varieties, indicating penetration at various levels. Anyone who's been to Singapore recently will know that there's a huge difference between educated Singaporean English and the English, the colloquial variety of Singapore English spoken by many people as, as a language of identity. So I'm arguing that English is an Asian language, not just a language of Asia. The second major development that needs to be taken into consideration is that the major use of English in contemporary Asia is as a lingua franca. It is used as a means of communication by Asian multilinguals, the first function identified by Catru above. Taking these two developments together, that English is an Asian language and its primary use is as a lingua franca, means, I argue, that English should be taught not as a language spoken and known by native speakers of English, but as an Asian language and as a lingua franca. English should not therefore be taught as a foreign language spoken by people from outside the country, but as an Asian language spoken by people who live in the country in which it's being learned. This in turn leads to two overarching principles that I think can be adopted in the teaching of English as an Asian lingua franca. Principle one, the native speaker of English is not the linguistic target. Mutual intelligibility is the goal. 
Now, I know this is a conference on the pronunciation of English, and this itself, this particular principle has some implications here. But the main goal of using English in this context would be that it is the English being used is intelligible to other speakers. And it may be that it's trying to achieve a native speaker model may not be particular, it may not be a very efficient use of classroom time. It might be better to concentrate on making sure that the children or the students, when they use English, are intelligible to people from different cultural backgrounds other than their own. And one particular thing here, which is of interest, is the difference between speech, so, so stress timing, and syllable timing. Many Asian languages are syllable timed. Most native speaker varieties of English are stress timed. But quite a lot of research, including research I did some years ago, suggests that people who retain a kind of syllable timing when they speak English are actually more intelligible than those who speak with a stress time variety. And myself and a colleague did a study of mutual intelligibility between Australian native speaker English Australian students and then Hong Kong students and Singaporean students. And it quite clearly identified that the most intelligible people were the Singaporeans and the least intelligible among the three groups were the Australians and they were the native speakers because the stress timing of the Australian speakers English was considered very difficult by the Hong Kong speakers and the Singaporean speakers to untangle. The second overarching principle is that the native speakers culture is not the cultural target. Intercultural competence in relevant cultures is the goal. So if one's learning English to be a Asian multilingual using English across Asia, it is important that those speakers learn about the cultures of Asia than the cultures of the United States or, the, or Great Britain, for example. If one's learning English in order to go and study in Australia, then of course, it makes sense to learn as much about Australian culture as possible. But if your major goal or aim for learning English is to use it as a lingua franca across Asia and internationally, then the cultural curriculum must be broader so that you understand what life is like for people outside your own culture. So Bangladeshi people who are dealing with Thais need to know something about Buddhism, for example. So I say intercultural competence in relevant cultures is the goal. In this way, I think Asian children can recognize that English is a language that belongs to people like them and not solely to foreign native speakers. A lingua franca approach can be adopted replacing the approach that sees the approximation of native speaker norms as the goal. Perhaps most controversially, and this is a very difficult argument to win, but I shall try again. Teaching English as an Asian lingua franca means that the teaching of English can be delayed at least until grade five of primary school, if not grade one of secondary school. There is a belief universally felt, as far as I can gather, among ministries of education worldwide, of the earlier the better. The earlier you introduce a language, the better it is. I would argue that that is simply not true in the, system, in the context of school systems. That it is much better to make sure that the children have fluency and oralcy in their own language before moving on to learning English. And then they will learn English much more successfully than if it's introduced too early, as I think it is. And if, if English is delayed, the primary curriculum can be freed up <clears throat> to allow local languages to be taught, either as subjects or as medium 
of instruction. Delaying the teaching of English until children have achieved literacy in both their mother tongue and their respective national language can actually improve children's chances of becoming proficient in English. I mentioned this before, but we'll do it again, mention it again. Results from successfully adopted MTB MLE programs produces children who are not only literate in their mother tongues, but whose proficiency in the national language and English is higher than those of children who are taught using only the national language and English as languages of education. This is really important research conducted by Decker. This is the Summer Institute of Linguists mostly and written up in these papers. And I think they're extremely important. So to conclude, English is here to stay. It's a language of basic education throughout Asia, but it can be taught as an Asian language and as a lingua franca. Its teaching can be delayed at least until upper primary, if not grade one of secondary school. The primary curriculum can focus on local languages. Far fewer children will drop out of school. More children can therefore develop literacy in local languages and the respective national language and proficiency in English. This also means, I would hope, that the division between the middle class haves and the have nots has the chance of being reduced. And local languages can be languages of or in education. Thank you for listening. That's it, and I'd be very happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Andy Kirk. He wants questions from you of any time, okay? So please raise your hand and the microphone will be carried over to you so that everybody can hear your question. So has anybody any question? Yes, Professor Hamid Rahman has a question from Professor Andy Kirkpatrick. Can't hear anything yet. Just a minute, the microphone is, technology is failing us. <laughs> I still can't hear, sorry. Can you hear me? I can now. Yeah, there's a theory of critical period hypothesis, which advocates that the earlier the better. There are arguments yeah. for and against it. But yeah. in many countries, for example, in Bangladesh, uh, it is started very early. I, it was once designed that it started grade six, then later on it started grade three, now it started grade one. I mean, it hasn't been very efficiently done. Also, there is a theory of the, you see, uh, bilingual method, uh, particularly Dodson uh, advocated that. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there is the strong argument for what you have said. But also there is the, 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 this, this side of the picture that if you, if you can uh, give good education with uh, in, in the foreign language or the second language at early, it may, particularly this, uh, we are having a uh, conference on pronunciation and yeah. we tend to think that if it is started early, uh, then the, it will be facilitate the, 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 the good learning of pronunciation. What's your opinion about that? It's a, it's a very interesting question, and it's one that is um, constantly raised. Uh, I go back to the critical, th the critical period hypothesis, which really argues that this is particularly valuable for attaining a native speaker-like pronunciation. But my argument is that given the fact that English is now an Asian language, 
And given the fact that the number of speakers of English worldwide is over 800 million, that's of non-native speakers, not native speakers. The variety of accent used in the speaking of English is enormous. And the issue then is not, I don't think, for children or learners to acquire what might be considered a native speaker pronunciation, but simply to acquire a variety of English that is mutually intelligible, as, as mutually intelligible as possible. And if that's the case, that means that the critical period hypothesis no longer holds because one is not aiming to give children or, or learners something approaching a native speaker standard. So that would be my response to that. I would say that the crucial thing in all teaching is the quality of the teachers. And as much resources, as many resources as possible need to go into developing a very fine cohort of language teachers wherever you are in the world. And the better the teacher, the better the result. And I suspect, I feel a lot of places do not really put enough resources into the professional development of their language teachers. Often they will, in, they will choose to actually, they would rather employ untrained people who happen to be native speakers rather than their local teachers. Whereas I would argue very strongly that any money used for employing native speakers in the context should be turned into developing professional development programs for local teachers. I hope that has sort of answered your question. <laughs> okay, any more question? Who has another question? Oh, okay. Thank you, Patrick, for your nice presentation and very much <coughs> in this presentation. Uh, when children start learning a foreign language, right? Uh, is it quite natural or we are doing something beyond nature? I mean, children of class uh, two and three. In Bangladesh, we teach English to our children. Is it quite natural? Thank you. And another question. We have been teaching English for 12 years in Bangladesh. What do you think about the length of this period to learn a foreign language? Thank you. Well, the, to answer the first part of the question first, the natural aspect of children learning language. If uh, a child is the child of a multilingual family, so that the mother speaks one language and the father speaks another and the family is happy and provides a sort of warm environment children will learn the languages in that natural environment uh, there are however many cases where i know a particular no two brothers from australia whose mother was a German speaker and father was an English speaker. One of the brothers has grown up speaking German and English happily, and the other one has grown up speaking only English. So there was a difference even between the brothers there. But the natural language learning environment is obviously a good one for children. My point is that schools are not natural learning environments. They are institutional uh, environments where the systems are quite different from natural learning environments of, of the home with multilingual parents. Second part of the question is, what do I think of 12 years learning English? Well, my answer to that would be, what do you think of the results of the 12 years of learning English in your own context? In places I have worked, there has been quite often what I would call a discourse of despair. Very often, ministries of education are saying things like, gosh, we spend so much money teaching our children English for 12 years, and yet when they graduate from secondary school, they can hardly put a sentence together. This is commonly heard in Japan, for example. It's a very common discourse in Hong Kong. Uh, it's a very common discourse in many parts of the world. So again, I think it's not the length of time that is important. 
It's the quality of the teacher, the quality of the teaching, and the motivations and reasons for learning that are more important than any length of time. There's another question from there on the, my left. Yes, okay. please tell your uh, name. Please tell uh, your my name. name is Yasir, I'm a phonetician. Well, the language teaching and learning will change dramatically. Uh, you know, Elon Musk has got a mission of inserting neural chips and artificial intelligence. The metaverse is in action. It will be in action in five to six years. Then mutual intelligibility between who and who? There is cross-border business. There is cross-border education. So if one nation, some particular people, they have got mutual intelligibility, that will not work. That will not run, that will not be actually helping you to run your business uh, for cross-border education. So isn't it that we are confining learning English uh, to, to, to allow everyone to, to come up with variety of Englishes? And can it be really logical? Well, I'm not sure it can be really logical, but leaving your musk to one side at the moment, perhaps the uh, uh, a system with uh, a circumstance I'm more familiar with is call centers. And uh, where we, we have people from all over the world dialing into a call center that might be based in somewhere in India or somewhere in the Philippines. And the, the break in communication there in terms of mutual intelligibility tends to be more with people run phoning in from the states to a lesser extent the uk but mainly the states who are native speakers of their variety of american english but who have not had any experience of living outside their community so it doesn't occur to them that their variety of english may not be familiar to the person they're talking to whereas other people who ring call centers, non-native speakers or speakers from other parts of the world, find it much easier. The call center handlers find them much easier to deal with than Americans, say Texans, phone, phoning in, who are Texans who have never been outside Texas. So it's all to do with familiarity. It all has to do with understanding and patience. Uh, if we want to understand one another, we need to make an effort to do so, and that takes some skill too, and some learning. We must understand that people speak English in different ways and not expect them to speak in this, exactly the same way that we do. And the more that kind of approach is developed, I think, the more mutual intelligibility and understanding there will be. Okay, that's the end of this wonderful session from London, uh, Professor, thank you very much. Bern, actually, I'm actually in Bern, in Switzerland. Switzerland, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the audience, uh, appreciate the audience. I, I hope you enjoyed the audience as much as we- Yes, thank you very much. And now- uh,